Welcome everyone, I'm Heather Moran. I'm Sixth and I's Executive Director and it's a pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Who's been here before? Wow, a lot of you, that's great, welcome back. And welcome to those of you who are here for the very first time. This beautiful historic space opened almost 110 years ago as a synagogue for our first 45 years and an AME church for the next 50. When the church put the building up for sale, there were no takers initially, and then they found someone who wanted to turn the building into a nightclub. Does that feel right? It didn't feel right. And luckily, three generations of families put money up to buy the building, and they had a vision for creating a new, vibrant, cultural and Jewish space in the center of downtown Washington, D.C. And now Sixth and I has established itself as a cultural hub for premium authors, speakers and entertainers, as well as being a non-traditional synagogue, where constructive dialogue and open conversation are not only embraced, but promoted. Tonight's event is part of that ongoing partnership between The Atlantic and Sixth and I, bringing The Atlantic's journalism to life through conversations with its leading editorial voices. Emphasizing ideas and topics most relevant to our lives, we've featured a diverse range of speakers. We've had Ta-Nehisi Coates and Anne-Marie Slaughter, Jeffrey Goldberg, and tonight we'll explore this month's extraordinary cover story, How to Build an Autocracy by David Frum. Now normally cover stories for The Atlantic are released online at the same time as the print her version hits the stands, but David's piece was released a full week earlier than originally planned. This decision was made after the executive order was issued by the White House concerning refugees and immigration. In a letter to Atlantic subscribers, Editor-in-Chief Jeffrey Goldberg explained that unusual times demand unusual publishing decisions. The publication of David's article coincides with a record number of people visiting theatlantic.com, which hit an all-time high in January and has continued into February. Now, many of you know of David Frum, but he is the senior editor at The Atlantic and the chairman of Policy Exchange. He was a speechwriter for George W. Bush and is an author of six books, including Comeback, Conservatism That Can Win Again, and a novel, which I really want to read, called Patriots. Tonight, David will be in conversation with Scott Stossel, the editor of Atlantic Magazine and the author of the New York Times bestseller, My Age of Anxiety, Fear, Hope, and Dread, and the Search for Peace of Mind, which I also need to read, and the award-winning Sarge, The Life and Times of Sergeant Shriver. During this time in history, and especially here in Washington, D.C., it is clear, it's clear by the number of people who are here to experience this event tonight, that people are seeking conversations about our political climate that are nuanced, reasoned, and persistent. In order to service that need, here at Six and I, we launched the November 9th Project. Through constructive opportunities for dialogue, activism, and education, we aim to broaden and deepen relationships between people who think differently from each other and explore the intricacies of the issues and perspectives that shape and impact our lives. With offerings ranging from Washington Confidential, our discussion-based group for federal employees, to hosting interfaith dialogues with area churches and mosques, to an upcoming conversation on race in America with Chris Hayes and Jamel Bowie, we hope you'll join us and let us know what kinds of ideas you'd like us to address. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us tonight, and please join me in welcoming David Frum and Scott Stossel. Well, thank you all for coming. Welcome, David. It's a pleasure you. to be here with you. Uh, ordinary, we, 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 we do these conversations about our cover stories with some regularity, and most of the time, we have the luxury of sort of sitting back and just talking about what's in the cover story, which in the case of, 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 of David's piece, how to, how to Build an Autocracy, is uh, full of rich and provocative material. The challenge we have now is that we're 29 days, 30 days maybe, into the uh, Trump administration, and every day 
brings new things to, to talk about. So what I was hoping is that we could, I, I want to focus the conversation as much as possible kind of around the arguments that you spelled out in, in your cover story, but maybe uh, deviate a little bit to talk about um, things that have happened uh, up in, 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 including today. And I, I should add to, you know, one, one of the reasons that the, 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 the quote attributed to Jeffrey Goldberg about why we put it up early was absolutely accurate. We felt like it was the right time and special time sort of demand special circumstances in terms of our publication schedule, but also David's piece, which is partly cast as a futuristic prediction, was turning out to be so uncannily prescient that what Trump was doing was so rapidly overtaking what David had spelled out that he would do in the piece that we started to realize, well, actually, this is going to be like, it's going to read like reporting after the fact, and we want to, we want to, we want to, want, want to get it out early. Um, but I wanted to uh, s start by asking, you, you, you have a very, um, well, I, I, I'll put it this way. As a country, we've been wrestling with how, how do we understand what the Trump administration represents? And you have a great quote in the piece, uh, and I'm going to bastardize it, but along the lines of, you know, if, if we knew, if we were talking about Honduras, we would, knew, we would know what to call this, but we're talking about the United States, and so we're flummoxed. What do we call what the Trump administration represents at this point? Um, based on what you've seen so far and based on what you wrote in the article. Well, thank, thank you, Scott. Thank you, you all. Um, it is such a pleasure to be uh, sitting on the stage without having to master the week's Torah portion first. <laughs> <laughs> a considerable relief. Uh, um, we would, the fancy term is authoritarian kleptocracy. Uh, the unfancy term is a banana republic. Um, I was on a um, I, I was on a plane today um, with a seat beside a woman who actually I was quite touched was carrying a copy of the magazine, and she told me that on election night she'd been having dinner with friends of hers who were um, emigres from Turkey, and she was assuring them, well, you know, it's not going to be so bad. We've been we've been here before, and they said, we've lived this. Let me tell you, it's going to be that bad. Get ready. <laughs> uh, I think one of the things that, that we need to bear in mind is Americans do not like to learn from the experiences of other countries. Um, the, the, the idea of American exceptionalism means you never have to listen to anybody. <laughs> but the developed countries are more and more alike. We share common experiences, and you can see the things that are happening that Donald Trump is moving towards partly consciously, partly unconsciously. I don't think he's a strategic mastermind, um, but I, I do think he's somebody who's got a shrewd sense, especially after he's made a first mistake. He gets shrewder when he's made a mistake than he has before he starts. He's best on defense because the paranoia then becomes a source of strength and ingenuity for him. When, um, th th this is a trend that you see in places like Hungary, in places like Turkey, in places like the Philippines, in places like South Africa after Nelson Mandela. Uh, the, these are, you have rulers who, they're not idealists, they're not filled with these demented projects of the, the Hitlers and the Maos and the Stalins, they just want to steal. But stealing in a modern bureaucratic state is difficult and dangerous, and you have to turn off the law step by step in order to steal. You have to turn off the free press in order to steal, um, and that's the risk we face, other countries are farther down the road, and it's important to study their experience and learn from it, and especially from the Central Europeans who are in many ways in a situation most similar to ours. Um, actually, I want to come back to Hungary because you talk about that at, at, at some length in, in the piece, but you mentioned you know, the distinction between an autocracy, and writers can never be blamed or take credit for the, the, the headline we put on their piece. Uh, Wrong. We never accept blame, but we always take credit. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the spectrum of kleptocracy to autocracy, where, where do you put, I mean, it sounds like it's more, you put Trump more on the kleptocracy side of the, of, of, of the spectrum, and, and that, I mean, and you alluded to this just now, is more about greed than deranged idealism. That, right. That's 
looking for silver linings. That's a good right. thing, right? But, well, look, this, this piece, although, um, you know, my wife is here tonight and uh, she chides me because I do have a tendency toward the pessimistic. But one of the things that I try to, th try to do through this is, is that wonderful moment in um, Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol where Ebenezer Scrooge asked the third ghost, are you a vision of things that must be or things that may be? And the ghost doesn't answer, but it becomes clear this is the vision of things that may be. It doesn't have to be this way. And one of the things, and maybe this is a good place to start with this amazing gathering tonight, of, which I were so flattered and honored by, one of the things that made Donald Trump possible, the reason he is president, is because we weren't good enough citizens. Um, and, you know, some of the, I mean, I'm a pretty conservative person, I'm a Republican, and you have to learn sometimes, you have to set aside what you want in order to accept what has to be, you have to accept the grown-up choice that you can't get, ev you can't get everything. You have to, there's some baseline things that you have to put up with. We weren't good enough citizens, and that's why he's president. But one of the things that has been really amazing, starting with Election Day, but even more since the inauguration, is this sense of accelerating citizenship. Um, and that has really been kind of inspiring. And I think this room tonight is a demonstration of that. That's why you're here. And everyone in media, everyone at the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post has noticed an in, not only more reader attention, but more reader engagement. You hear from people in a way that you didn't. You feel it in, on Facebook and other social media. People are more involved in, and more involved in a responsible way. People are coming to meetings. Um, if all of this had happened six months ago, then the present would be different. But maybe, maybe the curious gift of what we've been given is this is a chance to correct some of the things that have been wrong in our society and our democracy. Well, it's interesting. You've, you've anticipated one of my questions, which is in the piece. In a minute, I want to back up and give you a chance to kind of just lay out what you foresaw. And again, this was we closed this piece before inauguration, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Um, um, and I, and I want to ask you sort of what's unfolded differently from how you imagined it. But one of the things that you talk at length uh, in the piece and in and, and, and other venues as well is about what you were just saying is you know, the, 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 the greatest asset um, to a kleptocracy, autocracy is apathy of the, of, of, of the public. And, and you were concerned about that. And, and um, you've done a video for the Atlantic.com where you talk about, you know, here are the ways you can resist that. But are you heartened by the, what has been the potency of the response, and that, both in terms of you know, the size and intensity of the protests, you know, a.k.a. the resistance, mm -hmm. the uh, way that the press has been energized? Um, does, that, does that provide hope, and, and, or, or is well, that? Well, I think we, I, there's a lot of hope. There's also, we are really at a decision point. And today's press conference, I think, brings a lot, and this morning's, presidential tweet rage storm um, gives a sense of we are at a climactic moment here because behind the scenes behind, there is a struggle going on between law enforcement and intelligence on the one hand who have the story or who have pieces of the story that they think explains what happened in the election and a president who has the power to fire them and punish them and identify them and retaliate against them um, and when these, when the most recent round of Russia information broke, uh, culminating with yesterday, I think it was yesterday morning's New York Times story about how the FBI has identified four people who were in contact with Russian intelligence during the election, I think a lot of people had the feeling, okay, that's it, he's, he's cooked now. Um, but it really is a, a power struggle of a kind that is, it's very different from previous scandals in the past, um, and especially the, the Watergate comparison. I mean, if, we, we don't know exactly the facts, and we don't want to get ahead of the facts, but Watergate happened at a time of tremendous strain and stress in American life. The Vietnam War was being lost. Um, the United States was moving into the terrible recession of 1974 and 1975, the worst since World War II. Inflation was accelerating. There were gas shortages. Um, and so there was a, a, there was a lot of ambient a anger anyway. Whoever was president in 1973-74, it could have been, you know, 
George Washington. The, the, the public would have been enraged at that person because everything was going wrong. So there's now a, a scandal and a big one, and they tear them apart. We are in a much more benign environment for most people. Um, the economy is growing. Uh, inflation is low. Unemployment is improving. Gas prices are low. Um, housing costs are uh, uh, much more affordable than they've been for a dozen years. Um, and the, the consumer confidence is rising. The, that gives, and most people pay extremely little attention to the kinds of things that the people in this room are here to talk about. Uh, and that's understandable. That, that's normal life that they pay so little attention. But that means that all of these warnings, they resonate in this room, they resonate in places like this. They don't resonate with the 330 million fellow citizens who have their own concerns. And the president, if he has a bit of running room, has a power to there are not that many people who know these secrets, and they can be found if they, they're not known already, and they can be punished. And there are other people who are ambitious for their jobs, and other people who, presidents always have people who are ready to do their bidding. Um, and that struggle is what is going on. Um, and it, it is not obvious to me that the um, forces of law prevail. It, it could well be that they are isolated and defeated. And that has happened in other places. And Americans should not assume that they are immune to that. Um, I want to come back to the Russia question and a number of other things that you alluded to. But let's, let's step back. And, and I, I, I actually expect that a lot of people who are here have read David's uh, terrific story for us. But lay out, um, as briefly as you can, the scenario that you imagine. Right. And then also, again, given that we closed it, you know, a few weeks before we actually start to see this all unfold, what has surprised you? Has anything been more benign and has anything been more alarming? Okay. Um, so the story begins by envisioning, four years hence, the second inauguration of Donald Trump. Um, he's won the election of 2020. He's taking the oath of office in 2021. And the premise here is that the big measures of the Trump administration, the Republican Congress, tax cut, um, not a lot of spending restraint, uh, so fiscal deficits, they have their usual stimulative effect. And although that they will lead to inflation later, um, it's, it, it's going to, you're going to see a lot of demand-led growth. And if you combine that with stricter immigration enforcement, that demand-led growth will translate into wage increases in a way that it didn't much in the last two expansions. Uh, so he's got that wind at his back. He's been running, uh, I envision, a public works program that has created a lot of jobs for his core constituency of blue collar men who felt that the last economy didn't work in their favor, and they're happy. Um, and while there are rumors of corruption and wrongdoing, and while the inflation is accelerating, nothing has caught up with him yet. And because it's, it's hazy, it's not known, uh, because there have been no disclosures. And, and then it talks about what has happened, how he has held Congress and shut down investigations. It talks about how the, um, the, it isn't that the freedom of the press has been corroded because the First Amendment is still there and the New York Times is still winning Pulitzer Prizes for its investigations. But the conveyor belt by which elite media talks to the big public has been sliced. And it's been sliced uh, by um, this, new operate, this new control over social media. And let me tell you a, an example here of what I mean. One of the words I am trying to stop using is the word media, because it, care, it invites people to imagine a media landscape as it was 20 or 30 years ago. Giant companies, um, central distribution. The most, once you think of the most important media company in America as Facebook, and think of Reddit as one of the top five, and Twitter as one of the top 10, then the whole landscape looks different. Imagine this. Supposing there was a pro-Trump columnist at the Washington Post, and, the, and he was caught, or she was caught in some ethical infraction, and the Washington Post fired that person. And supposing the president was outraged and brought pressure to bear on the Washington Post to reinstate that columnist, and the Washington Post was compelled to surrender. We would think that was an incredible atrocity, a terrible violation of the freedom of the press, could never happen in America. That's exactly what happened at Twitter in the two weeks before the election. Two weeks before the election, Twitter shut down uh, about a dozen white supremacist accounts. Now, that's maybe good policy, it's maybe bad policy, we can that, leave that aside. That it's clearly, it's Twitter's decision to make, they're a private company just as much as the Washington Post, they do not have to provide a platform. I knew from my own conversations, I had a lot of, at that point, contacts in the Trump world, they were outraged by this, which is 
curious, but they, they were outraged. And some of the, part of it was they had some social connections with some of these people. They were really, really angry. And their view was that Twitter and Facebook were like common carriers. They should not be refusing passage to people because they didn't like them. And if we have a chance to do anything about this, we will. Donald Trump is elected. Shortly after that, he convenes a meeting with technology executives. Twitter, his favorite technology company, is pointedly not invited. And the day before the meeting, all of the accounts are not only reinstated, but verified. Now, this is not an atrocity, um, and may, but it's an example of, we don't think of it as a publisher, but it is a publisher. And the president has told them, and the president's team has told them who they should carry um, and how they should not drop the people he wants. One of the other things I want people to bear in mind, and I quote this in the article, and this goes to this vision. One of the things we le I learned in Hungary was in a modern bureaucratic state, the most important power you get from controlling the law is not the power to persecute the innocent. Viktor Orban, the authoritarian leader of Hungary, has not wrongfully arrested a single person. The most important power is the power to protect the guilty. And that is the power that wins you real friends. Um, that the people you, that when you punish people, they, there's no question, they are guilty. They have cheated on their taxes, they have violated zoning ordinances, no question. It's just that other people who have done the same things, who have had friendliness with the regime, they are protected. And, that, and now go object. And that is a real power. So it lays out how Trump has accumulated these powers and how, um, in a point, one other thing that is the mechanism. Uh, you remember that um, the head of the union local in Indiana, Chuck Jones, um, who disputed the president's account of what happened at Carrier. Uh, if President Trump were to say to the FBI, I want you to go put a scare in Mr. Jones. I want you to go threaten him. The FBI wouldn't do it, obviously. And if there were anybody at the FBI mad enough to try, a court would quickly stop them. You don't have to do that. What you do is you put Mr. Jones's name on your Twitter account, and there is a volunteer out there who will do it for you. In fact, there are hundreds of times. And Chuck Jones had to leave his house. He was driven into hiding by death threats. The death threats didn't come from government employees, but they were set in motion by a government employee, in the same way that the Comet Pizza shooter was set in motion by, uh, in, in, that, in his case, he was set in motion by the son of the recently departed National Security Advisor. Um, that... Per, uh, and that person had a, tr had a government email address. This, uh, my, General Flynn's son had a transition email account, and he set in motion that, that shooter. Uh, I don't think he intended to do any harm, but there is a social media enables a form of intimidation. Our own Julia Yaffe has been a target of this. Um, women journalists in particular have experienced this. And one of the things that is, um, I'll speak here as a little, little bit of the, a trade secret that has happened this year, this is a new thing in the past 12, year, 12 months, is trolling has leapt the barrier between digital and physical space in the past 12 months in a way it had not before. If you are, if, if you are receiving trolls, and especially if you're a woman receiving trolls, they will show up at your house and they will be armed. And um, Bethany Mendel, um, yeah. who's been very active, uh, she's married to the um, editor of the New York Post editorial page and she's been very outspoken. She was a recipient of this. Um, uh, Others whose names probably don't want to be mentioned. She's written about this experience. I'm not giving away her secret, but others have had this experience too. People show up. They show up at, your, at the houses of elderly parents. They show up at the bus stops where your children go to school, and they sometimes show up armed. It doesn't matter that the FBI doesn't do it. Does it just mean that the, the modern incarnation of Bre brown shirts, to use a loaded term, live online now? Yeah. Uh, although they, as you say, they cross the boundary. I don't want to use the emotive term. I use the term militia because I, I want to, you know, pe people, you, you, a lot of people use this Hitler analogy. And I think on the train of bad outcomes, there are a lot of stops before you arrive at Hitler station. And, <laughs> and you don't have to ride the train to the end for it to be say, I, I don't like my ride. <laughs> So, this I, we have this idea, unless, unless repression looks the way it did in the 1930s and 40s, we don't recognize it. And, and we're constantly inviting, com, inviting compare. But nothing looks like the 1930s and 40s. I mean, Americans do not walk on the sidewalks to go to work. So if you're trying to intimidate them, it would just be a total waste of effort to put people on the sidewalks to bother them. That's not where they are. Uh, you, have to go where, you have to go where the people are, and where the people are is online. And that's where the intimidation takes place. And 
one of the things that has happened, and, and you see this much more in Poland and Hungary and other places, is uh, that the, the people who are sponsoring this get quite good at understanding the places where people are where they are not political, leave them alone. You know, uh, you know the, in Hungary, the internet is uncensored, um, and uh, you, can, you can comment as much as you want. But social media is trolled, and you say things about the leader, uh, you just have to be prepared for a lot of frightening and upsetting experiences, always with that background menace that it could leap the barrier into physical space. So to, to use a word that you said that you don't want to use, media, one of the things that t to me has been most uncannily prescient about your piece was, and I assume this was based on what you'd already seen him do during uh, Trump do during the campaign, but also historical uh, example, is his use of not, 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 I mean, there's a lot of talk now about are we in a post-truth era, are we yeah. in a post-enlightenment um, era, you know, is, is, are we, is the end of empiricism? But your argument, which when I think about and, and look at what Trump's press conferences are like and what his public statements are like and the statements of his press secretary are, are not necessarily trying, sometimes they're trying to assert an alternate reality or an alternative set of facts as Kellyanne Conway would have it. But they're basically trying to, by throwing up all of this stuff and calling, they're, they're, they're calling into question the very idea of independently verifiable fact right. and of independent judgment. What, why is that, what, why does he do that and, and, and what are the consequences and the, and the dangers of that? Well, a very shrewd observer of Hungarian life when, when my wife and I were there in the spring talked about Russian foreign policy. And I said, the difference between Russia and the Soviet Union is that the Russians do not care if we trust them so long as we distrust each other. And that is one of the changes about this, about this modern kind of authoritarianism versus the totalitarianism, fanaticism of the middle of the years of the 20th century. If you became a communist or a Nazi um, in 1930, you signed on to an ideology, a whole total truth system. Um, they, they were a series of claims, there were a series of predictions, there were a series of beliefs, and you signed up for the whole thing. And you listened to the charismatic leader and you believed it. The hazard of that system was extraordinarily powerful, but it was also fragile. Because one day you might encounter something that you could not rationalize away. And then the system of belief would collapse and you would be disillusioned. It's much better if I start by saying, there is no truth, everybody lies, everybody steals. Um, don't believe anything. And then when you say, hey, wait a minute, you just lied to me. Well, of course I did. You have no right to complain. I told you I was going to. Uh, that, uh, and in fact, the, the lying reinforces it. And that filling the intellectual space with this mass of crazy stories and crazy lies, it, one of the things I was very struck by, I was at the president's press conference today, Still adjusting to calling him the president. Um, <laughs> uh, but he is. You know what? There, there's this mood, don't call him the president, don't give him the honorific, just call him Trump. I, I think you should not. He is the president. He has the power to end organized human life on this planet. Um, do not, and being rude about it will not take away that terrible, un, totally uncontrolled power. He can end organized human life on this planet. So he's the president. Um, at, one of the things that was striking about the, following the Twitter discussion of the president's press conference was how many people in the pro-Trump world were taking pleasure in his ability to obfuscate and throw chaff in the air. Uh, they didn't want to believe him, that they were, they were amused by the cleverness of the deception, by the brazenness of the lie. And this then raises a challenge for people um, like you and me and I, I think the people in this room. There's this view out there that one of the things that's wrong with America is we don't have the same facts, and that's why we're so polarized. And that we, if only some benign person could get us to sit down in a room and read the same facts and agree on what's true, that we would become less polarized. And that's very optimistic. But there's a darker possibility, which is we have different, it, it's not that we have, are polarized because we have different facts, but that we are, have different facts because we are polarized. People choose their facts, and people choose to believe things because they're congenial. And they, actually can choose to enjoy lies. Uh, and, and then they become publishers. And one of the things, we talked about being better citizens, one of the things that our smartphones and Facebook means is we're all publishers. 
every one of us. And if you have a couple of thousand fret to a pace with friends, or five, four or five thousand, a lot of, I mean, probably the grown-ups here don't, but our you know, children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews, they all do. Um, uh, you know, you have the reach of a small town newspaper editor in the 19th century. That's how many people would read the paper in Waterbury, Connecticut, or um, you know, places like that. You, you, you reach a lot of people. And your smartphone, you, po you, know, you can post, make videos. And that people set in motion systems of untruth and self-congratulation that just deprive us of the ability to respond critically to dangerous things. And at a moment when you need sort of a common civic spirit to stand up for principles like lying is bad, stealing is bad, um, it doesn't happen. And one last thing, and this is one of the things that is, I think, especially both energizing and debilitating about the moment, is that the ability to create scandals ultimately exhausts people. Um, and there are so many, you, you forget them, you can't keep up, and you're numbed, and your sense of what is normal is lost. And I think that's one of the I don't think that's a conscious project, but I think that's something that's happening. No, and you, you're, you're sort of talking around the famous Daniel Patrick Moynihan quote about, which now seems quaint, that uh, you know, you're entitled to your own opinions, but not to your own facts. We've pushed by, back the frontiers <laughs> of human rights in America, and now, God damn it, everyone is entitled to their own facts, too. <laughs> um, I want to keep in mind, I know it's a, it's a, it's a crude and hyperbolic an, an, an analogy, but it's a useful one in thinking about where we are, uh, you know, between the founders and the end point of Hitler station, um, about, about where, we, where we lie on that. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, or whatever it was, three weeks ago now, when, when the Trump administration first issued um, its poorly executed executive order on the, on the Muslim ban, um, Ben Wittes, who's a very smart legal observer wrote a thing for the Lawfare blog, um, and he was talking specifically about the executive order itself, um, but I think this can be extended to talk about the first month of the, of the Trump administration, and he said it was, if, I'm, if I remember right, uh, malfeasance mitigated by incompetence, um, which seems right to me, but I don't know what the proportions are. Where, where are we, or where, where, where do you think the Trump administration falls on the, on the spectrum of sort of concentrated malfeasance with a plan yeah. to incompetence, and actually, and, and, and which is better? I mean, it, w depending on where we are, like, w which is scarier, yeah. rank incompetence, or actually some kind of, um, uh, 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 in the worst imaginings, a fascist project? Yeah. Well, one of the things you asked was, what are the things that are worse than I feared, and what are the things that are better than I'd hoped? And one of the things that really is different is there is a higher level of operational incompetence than I expected. Um, and Man, you had low expectations. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, ex I expected them to be more, com I'm sorry, I, I, I'm more competent. I expected things to be just more professional. Oh, actually, gotcha. More professional. Um, I mean, there is a lot of you know, knowledge out there, and there are a lot of people who are willing to work for any president, and who might, both for bad reasons and, and for good. Um, so, like, the... the Reince Priebus, the chief of staff, um, is a conscientious and honest person. But he has never worked in government before, and he has never run an organization larger than the Republican National Committee, which isn't that big a, a group. Well, chief of staff is one of the most administratively demanding jobs on the planet. Um, and there's a real pattern when you look at previous administrations. Uh, who be, is the first chief of staff of a new president of a certain party, it's whoever had, was deputy chief of staff at the end of the last administration of the same party. Uh, and when I worked in the Bush administration, Andy Card was Bush's first chief of staff, and he had been the last deputy chief of staff. And he wasn't the most successful chief of staff, but he knew the job, and he, he knew uh, the, kinds of the kinds of paper flows that had to come to the president. He knew also the that the president should not be spending half his time dealing with communications. Um, he, you know, the, the importance of uh, the, the president's time is the most finite and precious resource in an administration. Well, so the idea that, that, and that you would have a, white, a weak White House counsel, somebody who couldn't say no to the president. One of the ways I think that the next that six months from now will be in a different place from where we are today is I think a lot of those people will be replaced by more competent professionals. There will be a more normal White House counsel. There will be a more normal national security advisor. And there, there may be, again, no denigration to Reince Priebus, but there may be a more experienced, or Reince Priebus himself may become a more experienced chief of staff. And a lot of the, the idea that, you know, that your, uh, the executive orders are bought from LegalZoom um, 
<laughs> I, I think that sense will be that sense will be over. Um, and is that, is but that... the malevolence will still be there, and, and and it will be a little bit more more subtle. So that sense, I think, the sense of chaos will subside, but the sense of danger will not. Well, and, and and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, that's an as interesting we, as we, as philosophical we, as we, question. Yeah. Um, do you like your malevolence executed um, <laughs> elegantly? Um, I, I think I think it will tend to. Con I, I mean. I think one of the things that will be helpful for just generally, I mean, first, there's a lot of the U.S. government that will just continue to operate. I mean, the passport offices will continue to issue passports as they, they should. The air traffic control system will continue to work. And I think um, those who are concerned about this administration will benefit, too, if the administration isn't flopping around in all kinds of places. But I, I think a lot we are going to see, we are moving toward a very concentrated study of, we're, we are going to be much, very focused on the relationship between the president and the intelligence agencies over the next few months, because that is a real um, struggle. Uh, my friend Eli Lake, one of the best national security journalists we have, wrote a column about Michael Flynn, sort of defending him, in which he said that Michael Flynn was the victim of a political assassination by the intelligence agencies. What I see is a political duel, kill or be killed. Um, and at the end, six months from now, we are either going to have a, a functional Trump presidency, or we're going to have independent and honest intelligence agencies, but we can't have both uh, because one, one precludes the other. One more thing about the Federalist Papers. The danger that the authors of the Federalists were most consumed by when they contemplated the presidency, what, they, they, they lived in a world in which the United States, there are four European powers present on the North American continent, um, Britain, France, Spain, and the United States, and the United States was far and away the weakest. Uh, they had witnessed um, Republican or near-Republican governments in Europe torn apart by foreign intervention. Um, Sweden, which had had a kind of um, limited constitutional monarchy in the middle of the 18th century, has, has a coup and becomes an absolute monarchy at the end of the 18th century because of the competition in British and French manipulation. Porn, Poland is ripped apart between 1772 and 1793 by, fo by foreign manipulations. Uh, the two last republics in Europe, uh, the three last republics, Genoa, Geneva, and uh, Venice, are snuffed out one by one by foreign powers operating from groups within. They were transfixed by this danger. And in Federalist 68, they talk about foreign autocracies elevating a creature of their own to the presidency. And the, all of their safe, the electoral college and all their other mechanisms were designed to defeat foreign manipulation. And their ideas had a real, 229 years is a really good run. I mean, they really, they work for a long time, but the, eventually the danger they contemplate comes to pass. And uh, as I said, you build, you know, you put up a coat of paint and it lasts for 229 years, you will be, you know, pretty impressed with yourself. You put up a fence and it lasts that long, good job. So that, that's what they did, but we are now at their pressure point, and that is, I think, going to be the first great crisis and test of the system. Um, to pause for a moment on, that, on this notion of incompetence, you served for two years, if I'm not mistaken, yep. uh, in, the, in the early H.W. Uh, Bush, or, or sorry, W. w. Bush, Bush uh, administration. Every White House, particularly early on, has its share of turf wars yep. and uh, sort of chaos and leaks and that sort of thing, and, 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 and bouts of incompetence. Was there anything that you saw in your two years in, in the Bush White House that came at all close to what we've seen in, yeah. in 29 days here? Um, I can talk both about the Bush administration and the Clinton administration. I have this amazing class in comparative presidential administration caused by the fact that um, the Addis Israel Preschool started the pre-K program uh, 20 minutes earlier than the K program. And so I had children of exactly the same age as Michael Waldman, who was uh, Bill Clinton's chief speechwriter. And so there was this every day we would arrive there and we would drop, you know, one child off for the 8.45 start and then we'd have to wait 15 minutes for the other <laughs> child uh, till the 9 o'clock start. And we sort of did this comparative class in um, how administrations work. I, I learned, I, I'm endlessly indebted to Michael. I, most of what I know about U.S. government comes from those conversations. So this is how Washington works. This, this is how drop Washington works. This is how Washington works. So, uh, so, yeah, administrations start badly, always. 
They start badly for a couple of reasons. First is um, presidents have to reward the people who are on the campaign with Mac McClarty. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, uh, all your friends from back home, the campaign people, they have to go up to the White House with you. And, and also, every president says, I am not going to let the usual Washington crowd tell me what to do. You know, all those guys who served in previous administrations, I've got my people back from Texas or Arkansas or California, wherever. And then it turns out they can't cope with this job, and you need people who've done it before. It's really hard. So that's one thing that goes wrong. Um, the second thing that goes, that, well, there was a very particular thing that went wrong with the Bush administration, which was because of the recount, we had half as much time. And so the administration was miserably thinly staffed. Um, George W. Bush did not have, there was not a, uh, a Senate confirmed person in the, there are two Senate confirmed people in the Defense Department, the biggest department of the government, as late as the 1st of July. Um, it just had taken that long. And there are turf wars, um, and there are shakedowns, and um, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. But what, here's what, what, um, what's different this time, I mean, among the things that are different. Uh, the first is, if you are fortunate enough to be elected with a Congress of the same party, there's a pretty well-worked-out idea of what you're going to try to do. Uh, Bill Clinton had his idea, uh, Barack, Obama, Barack Obama inherited a series of emergencies, but, but still there was sort of, he had a worked out idea with the fellow Democrats of things they, they wanted to do, and George W. Bush certainly had a program. Um, and there's a lot of expertise in the committees of Congress, especially on the things that are not the president's number one and number two priority. Uh, so you then start drawing on the resources of Congress. People have had bills in their desk for five years, eight years, and you draw on those. Um, you are able to draw on um, after a while, past administrations. And there, you also have a, a, a kind of a, a tough but forgiving relationship with the press. You know, one of the things, one of the resources that the Trump people threw away um, is you need somebody in any administration who can call the editor of the New York Times, the director of, the political director of CNN, and say, I know it looks like A happened, but it didn't and you just have to trust me on that. It's, the story is not true the way you think it looks. Trust me on this. And you get to do that one time <laughs> before, if, and if you break that one time, you never get to do it again. And one of the things I'm sort of stunned about by Sean Spicer is like, they threw that away. And just, that, one of the things that was, that was striking to me about the president's press conference today was there's just, like, the journalists are just giving him these looks like, you again? You know, really? Really? I'm supposed to... And the, the, he, they, 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 they burn through that heat shield that surrounds presidents. Um, I want to... So the next three questions I want to ask you, best case scenario, what scares you most, and what we can do to mitigate what scares you most. So best case scenario. So my dad's in the audience, and he's like, what's the big deal? The stock market's up. Um, we haven't gone to war with anyone yet. You say at the beginning of, of, of the piece, you could actually imagine that uh, because of the de deregulation of business, tax cuts, uh, an infrastructure program that actually provides a Keynesian boost to the economy while actually shoring up our infrastructure, four years from now, eight years from now, we, the economy might be looking pretty... I mean, is, is there... I mean, I'm, I, I, yeah. I, I, I don't believe a word I'm saying. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but <laughs> but is, is, there, is, there, is, there, is there a way where this could all work out or that somehow the average of all their crazy sort of cross-cutting things averages out to be, well, you know... Um, well, well, economically, I'm a lot more optimistic about the... F if he were to have an eight-year term. Um, because in the four-year term, the stimulus will have its effect without... Um, generating inflation without generating economic dislocations, and the corruption will, the, co co the costs of corruption um, and favoritism will not be uh, too. I mean, you, you all saw the story today, I think, about how uh, the president had uh, the head of Lockheed on the phone, and he had the head of Boeing on the phone, unbeknownst the head of Lockheed. And you think, what is that? Is a weird, weird story. But there's no good explanation for why that could have happened. So I don't know the, I haven't figured out what the angle is, um, but there's an angle there. So here's the, here's the optimistic scenario and then here's the scary scenario. The optimistic scenario is not that the Trump administration is okay, it's not going to be okay. The optimistic scenario is that there is a level of civic mobilization that we have not seen for a long time. I, I think the, the group that I keep recommending to people is the model. Of, act, of the most successful activist movement of my lifetime is Mothers Against Drunk Driving, uh, which is a group with an extremely focused agenda, very broad membership. You know, uh, 
They didn't care what you thought about guns or abortion or taxes. That you didn't even have to be a mother. Um, but you thought we should have tougher enforcement against the rules of, of drunk driving. Come on to the meeting and and then go argue with mothers against drunk driving because it's a pretty positive group on the one side and a pretty negative group on the other. And they have tr the transform. You know, you know, the older people will remember. The most popular comedy show on American television in the late 1960s is the Dean Martin Show. Its number one theme for jokes was the hilarity of having too much to drink and driving home. Um, and, that, and that was something that you watched on, what was it, Saturday night? And, and people thought it was hilarious. And I mean, that is like a joke you, you could not even contemplate. You'd be thrown out of the writer's room if you thought about it. You just couldn't. And, and indeed, highway fatalities are down um, in an amazing way. And, and they continued, and we've had not many technical improvements to cars since the middle 1980s. It is, uh, so groups like that organize and demand laws that the president releases tax return, demand an independent investigation of the Russia connection. And the, and the president is just sort of hemmed in. And he decides golf and TV is, are really going to be his two top priorities for the rest of his administration. <laughs> and, and, then, and then you get sort of normal governance. And you know, probably the more liberal people in the audience wouldn't like what then happens. The more conservative people can live with it. And then you sort of get through at the presidency. That's the most optimistic scenario. But the past, there are, it's very easy to imagine some really scary things happen. Let me just point to two, because we haven't talked much about foreign affairs, but the scariest things do involve issues of war and peace. And here are the two that I, I think bear worrying about. Um, the first is the relationship with China. Um, uh, Trump has been, and his people have been steering to confrontation with China, having first alienated all of America's allies in the Pacific. They tear up the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which bears very heavily on countries like Vietnam and the Philippines, the poor members of the um, contain China coalition, and they had this, we don't know whether he literally yelled at the Prime Minister of Australia, but um, you know, I noticed today when the President listed all the positive phone calls he had, he did not mention Australia. He was not at pains to say, you know, that was a better phone call than everybody else told you it was. And that's America's most militarily capable ally in the region. So you're steering toward a confrontation with China with no friends. Um, and that can only end badly. But the more, the most frightening thing and it goes back to the Russians. We have an, an American armored brigade has just in the past few weeks been deployed in Poland. Um, there are British and French troops moving into Estonia, uh, Canadians and Latvia, Germans in Lithuania. Uh, Britain and France, of course, are also nuclear powers. Uh, the Russians have had this huge arms buildup and are behaving increasingly aggressive and provocative ways. And they think they have, they, or I shouldn't say they think, I don't know what they think, but it is possible that they think that they have somebody in the White House who owes them and who will yield to them. And they may miscalculate how, uh, the most, I would say, the, you know, the second worst thing you can do is what President Obama did in Syria, which is draw a red line and not enforce it. But the worst thing you can do is have a red line that people don't know about. Uh, because that is, then they trip the red line and then terrible things happen. So those are some of the, uh, the worst things. Another terrible thing that could happen is that it, one more, th third thing, and, is that in Donald Trump's attacks on the intelligence services in order to protect himself, he disables the country's defenses against terrorism. And while he is throwing, while he is um, borrowing from the country the head of the German-American friendship group in the Bundestag, which he literally did because the person was born in Iran, um, that other people who do not come from the seven countries on the list are able to continue to come into the country and we have so disabled the security services that we are less well protected than we have been in the past few years. So you, you wrote an original piece and I think you wrote again yesterday that what stands the, 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 the most potent bulwark against the worst of Trump's excesses are Republicans in Congress. Yeah. Um, Not the most potent, but the sort of the most proximate. The most proximate. They, they haven't been very potent. Well, no, no, well, they haven't been potent at all, and that's one of the questions. Um, and in fact, I'm trying to find the original quote here. Um, Congress can protect the American system from an uh, overbearing president, but will it? Um, it hasn't. You yeah. called them out about this yesterday. Do you think they will? And, um, and, and if, and if not now, what will it take? What's the tipping point where, where they well, actually would do that? Well, it takes us. I mean, that one of the, that, that there's a big difference in the Republicans in the Senate and the House. Um, so the, the Senate 
is just full of people who would like to be Brutus and Cassius to Trump's Julius Caesar. <laughs> they would love it. And I think in a few cases, like John McCain, I don't think I'm speaking metaphorically here. <laughs> A2 McCain. Yeah. I think they would really, you know, just like a, like a slow, or maybe just call them and make people run up legal bills and slowly torture them in front of congressional. But so there are people in the Senate who would like to do it. But there's a collective action problem. You need enough of them. Um, and in the House, there's ideal. But here's, here's what, what is stopping them. Um, so John Kasich was the last man standing in the Republican Party running against um, Donald Trump, and Rob Portman, also senator from Ohio, was, um, who ran much better in the state, was obviously very un, um, unenthralled by Donald Trump. So some of us thought that the Ohio State Republican Party would be the real bulwark of internal opposition to Donald Trump. In January, the chairman of the Ohio Republican Party comes up for re-election. It's a man named Matt Borkus, a very effective chairman, good fundraiser, uh, close to Kasich. Um, he, there had been a story about him, and he'd been very skeptical about Trump. There was a story about him in the Cleveland Plain Dealer. He and his wife were watching the TV, and his wife had not voted for Trump, and, they were sort of, and Borges was agonizing about his vote. Uh, but the thought was Borges would be re-elected, and the Ohio Party would become this force. And Trump got the same thought. So he, this president who doesn't have time to read his presidential daily intelligence brief, began making calls to members of the Ohio State Party Committee. And he made enough calls to enough Ohio State, I mean, I don't know, it's 20 people, I don't know how many people are on the committee, I should know that. Um, but he made enough calls to flip the vote and to defeat Borges and to promote instead a Trump loyalist who had not been much of a fundraiser, not been much of a president of the party, not generally well-liked, but because beholden to the president, he was able to put pressure. And that sent a message to every statewide office holder in the Republican Party. If he can reach into John Kasich's state, and John Kasich has really high approval numbers, John Kasich's state and take away Kasich's party from Governor Kasich, he can do it to you in almost any state in the country. And that, that's the restraint. So they need an equal and opposite force, both good of fear and hope, from voters in their states. And that requires a mobilized public opinion. Uh, I'm going to ask you to indulge in an imaginative exercise here. You're Paul Ryan. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're poised to finally enact uh, what you've been stymied on f since 2006. Um, tax cuts, un, un, uh, rolling back Obamacare, if you can figure out what to replace it with, um, uh, all kinds of other things. And yet, you're dealing with, let's not call him the devil, but you're dealing with Trump. Yeah. What, what is your political calculus, and how, and, and how far do you go to finally realize your policy ambitions yeah. before you've sold your, you, you, you've, you've really uh, struck a Faustian bargain for, with your political soul. Well, Ryan's calculus, I think, is evident to everybody. I mean, we all see what the choices he has made. Um, and uh, that he, he is going to work with Trump to try to pass this agenda. I mean, the Republicans have this problem, right, that we've won the popular vote one out of the past seven, the national popular vote one out of the past seven times. The Ryan agenda is not very popular, and in many ways it's not very complete. There isn't actually a plan to uh, replace Obamacare. So, um, you know, the parliamentary problem is, is like, you have to write the law to pass it, and the law has not been written. Uh, but yes, he sees a lot of things beckoning, and he's made this calculus. He's also worried about defections, because many of the House Republicans, they come from very safe seats, and they're very excited about Trump, and certainly their voters are very excited about Trump. I, I think Notwithstanding all the protests that are happening over ACA. Well, but, but, their, but their core vote, I mean, the, the, the um, typical congressional district is what? like a couple hundred thousand people in it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's startling when 600 to 900 people come to a meeting. But a, it there's, is not, necessar solidly yeah, not necessarily a career-ending thing. Um, but what Ryan has, here's the thing he has to worry about, and this is the thing that may break his calculus, and it was the end of the piece I wrote about the report. Ryan is gambling his reputation, his soul, on the idea that Donald Trump will sign his bills. But the, what he is discovering is, Donald Trump isn't originating the bills. There are no bills. There's no, you know, that uh, it's 
a month in, there's no tax cut plan. There's no corporate tax. Uh, and one of the, this, these are especially difficult things because Republicans in the House and Senate tend to have systematic differences. The difference between coming from safe states and representing statewide people. Senators are more vulnerable. Uh, those differences can only be ironed out by the president saying, right, we're doing it this way on, on this measure, we're doing it this way, we're going mostly with what the House Republicans want, a little bit with what the Senate Republicans want, or vice versa. Applies to Democrats too. Um, they are, uh, there's no presidential leadership on taxes. There's no presidential leadership on health care. There's no presidential leadership on um, financial reforms, really. Uh, and so, and you can't do this from the Speakership of the House. And the, t the clock is ticking. And Donald Trump, and also what you need the, pre the president to do, one of, the, one of the constraints you have is the Senate clock is even tighter because they have to approve the president's cabinet and subcabinet. And that they, you want that to go fast, 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 fast. But Donald Trump hasn't even named these people. You can't excel, race, through his, race through the deputies when they haven't even been nominated. Because, and that goes to this question of operational incompetence. There are, they, don't, they haven't named the deputies. The Senate can't confirm them. And while the Democrats are slow walking, yes, it makes their life a lot easier when the person that you want to slow walk is late arriving even at the front door. And... So one of the things Ryan has to worry about is this, his whole plan may just implode. And at some point, the thought is going to occur to people, boy, life would be easier if Mike Pence were president. Life would be just, that would be a dream come true. And, uh, and while impeachment uh, is a, an extreme and dangerous remedy, and one, uh, people talk about it, are talking about it a lot these days. It's not something to be lightly talked about. It is a social convulsion. Um, but, you know, presidents, the oldest president in history may have some health problems that require him to spend more time in Florida. Um, and, Does you know, it would be almost unnatural if he, di if he didn't want to spend more time in Florida. And there is a mechanism for if the president is not feeling in the best of health to, that his friends and supporters can... This, the 25th Amendment? It's the 25th or? Amendment. And there's nothing, it doesn't, there's no reflection on the quality of the performance the president has done. Uh, and you say, you know, thank you for your service, but you don't look so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, three, I guess, lightning round questions, and I want to make sure we have to get, get, get to questions. Um, one of the very interesting things you talk about in, in your Atlantic piece is I mean, on the one hand, you talk about how apathy is a dangerous thing um, when you've got a, a president like Trump. On the other hand, displays of civic unrest become a tool for yeah. him. Talk about that. All right, so... Um, though, uh, there is this myth in American culture that the Vietnam War, that the Vietnam War protests ended the Vietnam War. And that's not what happened, of course. They, they re-elected president, they in fact elected President Nixon in 1968 and they empowered him going in because the Vietnam protests allowed themselves to be defined by the most radical members. Um, that America has an expressive protest culture. Occupy Wall Street was maybe the latest demonstration of this. Um, there's, a, there's a fantastic book that made a big impression on me uh, a long time ago called After the Ball, which was written by two it was written in the late 1980s by two gay rights activists. And they, are, this is, they said, this is how to do it. And it's an attack on gay pride parades. And they had this whole model. And it's, it, this is what, I mean, they, maybe other people read the book, but they described how, you know, if you were a social movement, you had to identify yourself with the most conservative forces in society and demonstrate that you had an affinity with them. And they had a series of campaigns. That don't do, you know, don't have men in leather jock straps. Have, you know, gay scout troops cleaning the highway and, um, and have, you know, gay veterans standing, and, and this is how the gay rights movement um, prevailed. So I think it's important that you, that you understand that protest is not a form of self-expression, it's a form of communication and persuasion. Um, and like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, you need to make your group not only as big, but as welcoming, and you need to make, you need to make an impression on persuadable people. So, one, um, you know, if, if Madonna wants to come to your rally and do a narcissistic performance, you know, she has lots of opportunities to do that. So, uh, and one of Trump's methods, one of the, he's a very shrewd persuader in his own way. One of his methods is to try to goad people into doing things that help him. Remember when he 
tweeted out, um, flag burners should have their citizenship stripped. So that's a pretty um, bold thing to say. There had been no flag burnings to that point, but sure enough, when the president tweeted that, two people obligingly showed up in front of a Trump building and burned a flag for the cameras that happened to be there. We don't know who those two people are. I actually may have some dark suspicions about what they were doing there and how they got there, but maybe they just were inspired. But things that, uh, and it's certainly true that there are people who carry the Mexican flag at these protests, uh, that people will chant anti-cop slogans. So it's civil, that, there's, that meetings are best, uh, that organizational meetings, that peaceful protest that inspires people to get to know one another and then to go to the organizational meetings, but true unrest is radically counterproductive and it creates a narrative of disorder that Donald Trump, you saw him say today, the country's a mess. The country's not a mess. The country's, the economy's growing. He needs the disorder. Um, and not just as a resource to justify authoritarian methods, but as a way of polarizing the, comp the country apart from each other. And the, the more that the people who ob object to Donald Trump have affinity with those people who support him, the more the people who support him are going to say, you know what, they're making points that resonate with me. They look like my people. Well, and you just helpfully segue to my second to last question, which is, and what will happen is when there is show of civil disorder, it runs nonstop on Fox, and Breitbart write, writes yeah. about it. Talk about the role of Breitbart and Fox. And I, I can't remember, I, mean, I, I mean, you used to be a Fox, uh, 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 you know, talking head yeah. in good standing, right? I, I, I did hundreds and hundreds of interviews on Fox, and I, I made one joke too many. And <laughs> uh, I, when I, I was, it was tw 2010, and I had just been fired from the American Enterprise Institute. Um, one of the things I, I'm really, one of my resolutions at the Atlantic is to try to hold this job. Um, <laughs> we're, we're not anti-joke. <laughs> but, so I, I, was, I was fired from AEI for something I, I'd written that proved a little too memorable. And, and then I, I got a, I, I was doing some television afterwards, and uh, I was interviewed um, on ABC Nightline, and, so, and somehow the topic of Fox came up. And it was not germane to my firing at all. Uh, but I then, I said, well, Republicans used to think that Fox worked for us, and now we're discovering that we work for them. And uh, the great exception was taken. It was like a perfect fatwa from that moment on. And to this day, about you know, once every six months, I'll get a call from a very young-sounding booker who will ask me if I will come on some show. And even if I'm going to be like in Europe, I'll, I'll say, sure, I'll be there. Uh, Go tell your executive producer you talk to me. <laughs> and, and, and then an hour later, they'll be an embarrassed way. Oh, we're taking the show in a different direction. So. <laughs> uh, um, but I think one of the real indicators of what was to come was the struggle between Sean Hannity and Megyn Kelly. And in some ways, it re resonated with the struggle between Hillary Clinton and um, Donald Trump, that there was this, this blowhard man against this competent woman. Um, and... In the early rounds, everybody believed that the, that the woman was going to win, and she was pushed to the side. And Fox and Primetime is now a wall of Trump propaganda delivered by, you know, man after man, white man after white man after white man, the, the, the opposite of the formula everywhere else on cable, cable news. Um, and one of the things, if you, those of you who have not watched Tucker Carlson's show, he's an old friend of ours, um, but I recommend it because what Tucker, who's, he's, a brilliant television personality, and he's really figured this out for the new age. It is a theater of cultural grievance for an hour, an hour of cultural grievance. And he's just, um, it, it's just, so, you know, the question, you know, uh, Donald Trump is stealing a lot of money, or his son-in-law is taking bribes from the Chinese, we think there are Russian spies in our government, and then there'll be like some blogger at Berkeley who has said conservatives are stupid, and, and then Tucker will put him on TV and rip his head off, because he's very good at this, and humiliate him, and everybody will feel like, his audience will feel like, I've been vindicated, these other things don't matter. Um, how, and one of the things that we all have to do, goes back to the point about civil unrest, is in the understanding that that's the method, that method of cultural grievance, it's really important not to give it fuel. Um, and it's, it's really important to say, you know what, we, we are not having a culture war here, we're not having a cultural dispute uh, we are having a dispute about integrity in government and about patriotism. And the, with the, this suspicion that the president, 
the United States has this unhealthy relationship to a hostile foreign power, it's really important that his opponent sees the symbols of the republic. That's not his flag. It's not the flag he came in under. Um, it's your flag. You oppose him, you're fighting for America. Carry the flag. Well, and that's my last question. What do we make, and ne neither you nor I are, are scholars of uh, Russia or Russian intervention, st stipulate that, but w what's your read on this developing story? I mean, th this could be, um, on the one hand, it could be whitewater, a um, lot of smoke but no real fire, but that manages to derail the agenda. On the other hand, it could be Watergate on steroids, as I've yeah. seen it. And, you know, you've got, I mean, it's, I, as I see it, there's sort of three strands that are now kind of congealing. You've got the New York Times reporting yesterday or the day before that, uh, and Trump denying today, but that Russian intelligence agents were in contact with people, you know, in the Trump campaign orbit throughout 2016. That's number one. Number two, you've got Mike Flynn's conversation with the ambassador during the transition, um, which has everyone talking about the Logan Act, which I'm sure none of us had ever heard of um, before uh, a couple weeks ago. It's we, that thing nobody ever enforces. That's, that's well, what that's the thing, right. Um, and, then, and then the sort of sexiest, juiciest, and probably most remote thing, which is the Steele dossier. Yeah. Um, although, who knows? Um, what, what, what do you make of all this? And is, well, um, the parts of the scandal that upset me are the parts that have all happened in plain sight. Um, I, I, there's, there's, I mean, these other things are really disturbing and upsetting and scary. They may or may not be as bad as it, they look when you read them in the New York Times. But here's what you already know. You al already know that the Russians carried out espionage activities against an American political party. Um, now, what ought to happen is, at that moment, is the, rea the, nor the healthy reaction is nobody picks on my brother but me. Um, right, that both parties have a common interest in, um, obviously they want to kick the hell out of each other, um, but they both have a common interest in excluding other people from doing that. Um, so you would, exp but no, that, that, that Trump worked with it. Mag I mean, the, the, remember that those locker up chants were all premised on the idea that there were enormous crimes revealed by the WikiLeaks documents. It was a series of nothing burgers. The most exciting was the revelation that during an inter a democratic primary debate, Trump always elides that, that Donna Brazil had given a question or two that she had somehow found to Hillary Clinton to advantage her over Bernie Sanders. Um, so that was very wrong of Donna Brazil, obviously, and she lost her CNN contract, which was correct. And I don't know how much of a help it was to Hillary Clinton to hear that when she went to Flint, Michigan, there was going to be a question about the water. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, every little bit, <laughs> every little bit helps. Um, uh, but these are not crimes. These are not crimes. But so Trump worked with it, and then that famous press conference in July of 2016, where he said to the Russians, "I hope you know. I hope you're listening." This all happened in the light of day, and the alignment of American foreign policy with Russia, priorities on Crimea and Ukraine and Syria and NATO and the EU, that all happened in the light of day. And the fact that Steve Bannon, the president, the candidate Trump's then most important aide, is making common cause with all of these really sinister political parties from Europe, that all happened in the light of day. Um, and the fact that the, that the Russians said, we want this guy, that happened in the light of day. The only thing that is a mystery is did anybody at the Trump campaign call the Russians back? Yeah. Was there collusion? So that gives it extra torque. But I, don't, I don't need, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, okay, let's say that didn't happen. I don't need that to, be, to believe you have people exercising power who are in thrall in obvious ways to a, not, to a hostile foreign power, and that's unacceptable. Um, let's, let's let people line up, but while they are, one last question. Steve Bannon explains, do, do you know Steve? Uh, and I, I actually had a cameo in one of his movies. <laughs> Um, and what, what, what's his, what does Steve Bannon want? So, um, Steve Bannon has been married and divorced three times. Um, there are accusations, and these of course can be false because people can allege anything, of domestic abuse in one of the marriages. Um, he's pretty visibly a, a drinker. Um, he's obviously a person with a lot of rage issues, and we know some of his thoughts, and they don't make a lot of sense, but they are, this is a, there are, there's a kind of nihilism in the capital N sense of that word, a, a desire to see existing things overthrown because of a rage against the world as it is. Um, again, 
not to go to Hitler Station, but Dorothy Thompson is a great American foreign correspondent in Germany in the 1930s, when she was writing about who in German society was susceptible to becoming a Nazi and who wasn't, said it was a, observed it was a strange thing. Happy people never became Nazis. Interesting. With that... <laughs> when you mentioned Matt Borges in Ohio, uh, you also uh, talked about indirectly Jane Timken, who yeah. actually happens to be a pretty good fundraiser, but the person that was behind that is a fellow who you and I know named Bob Paducic. Bob Paducic is somebody who is um, sort of a shadow person over at the RNC overlooking Rona Romney McDaniel. And I mention this because one of the tactics that the Trump administration seems to use is to sort of have a shadow government or a shadow person. It's That's very interesting. Seen, you may have seen in the news today, um, uh, Steve Feinberg right. is being uh, considered for the sort of oversight person in the intelligence community. So my question is, what do you think about this concept and the dangers of this sort of shadow minders, which other governments of a, of a particular nature have used? And, and in particular, yeah. what do you think of Jim Comey a lot of people think he's the devil around here, but I think that actually he might be the savior as well because I think he's actually a person of great integrity and that's yeah. what got him in trouble. And he's gonna be one of the people leading these investigations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you raise a lot of points. And I, I, some of them go beyond my expertise, but I'll say one thing about the, the shadowing. Um, I have a friend who had a lot of experience in intelligence and defense matters. who went to the NSC swearings in and said, this reminds me of the atmosphere around Iran-Contra, because Iran-Contra was all about short-circuiting procedures, um, and there were things that people wanted to do and that the existing norm rules didn't allow them to do, and they created instant institutions, and, or they by bypassed them. And what happens is you find yourself in a very big ocean in a very small boat. Unable, you can't execute these policies with small little bands of individuals in the federal government. The projects are just too big, and then troubles troubles erupt. And yeah, that you bring in some guy, I mean, Steve Feinberg seems to be a very capable financier, but to run the, intelli to, to oversee the reform of the intelligence services of the United States, you want someone, you know, who's not buying intelligence services for dummies at uh, Barnes and Noble. In the conflicts, <laughs> he, I mean, he owns DynCorp. I beg your pardon? In the conflicts, he owns DynCorp. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, and I just want to remind everyone, okay, thank you. Keep your, make sure you actually have a question, not just a statement, and be very succinct, because we've got a lot of people who want to ask questions, so go ahead over here. Uh, Mr. Fromm, uh, I truly appreciate you doing this, and you're becoming a, a real uh, moral uh, authority uh, in, in, in this I don't, the resistance fight. Uh, I was fascinated by listening to your uh, opening statement on, on the recent uh, Intelligence Square debate. Uh, that it's, uh, thank you. Um, you're a Republican. Who else from your side of the aisle is doing the same thing? Is speaking openly and telling us wh where are we going with this administration, that we are moving towards that last stop? Well, th there, are, there are actually a number of, of people. They tend to be concentrated in the think tank and media world, not in the true political world. Um, I think of Pete Weiner, who's a colleague of mine from the Bush administration, very close to Karl Rove, and he's at a think tank called the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and he's been very outspoken. Um, Jennifer Rubin at the Washington Post. Um, I, I could, there are a lot of, there are a lot Michael, of, Michael Gerson. Michael Gerson, Tom Nichols, who's a professor at the Naval War College, Elliot Cohen, who's been a contributor to the Atlantic, but they tend to be writers and think tank people, um, and not political people. Are they a small minority? What's that? Are they a small minority at this point? Uh, yes, they are a small minority, but sincere Trump supporters are also a small minority. I mean, the Republican world is divided into, I would say, four groups. The tiniest are people who sincerely believe in the Donald Trump project. And then the next smallest are people who are outspokenly opposed to the Donald Trump project. The two big groups are people who are afraid of him and people who hope for something from him. And they are probably 80%. But those groups may shrink over time, and I think the, the group that is sincerely convinced of him is not going to grow. Over here. Um, the two books, of the two books that are hitting the Amazon top 10 list, you've got 1984, and you also have The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. And I'm struck by what has not been talked about in this conversation which is the domestic impact 
and actually the international impact of what has been perhaps overdramatically called the war on women, but the assault, I would say, on the status of women, women's health, the status of minorities, Black Lives Matter. Um, and I would like to put that into the conversation because I'm as worried about that as I am about all the things that we've been talking about so far. Was it? That's a great point. I will give you my perspective, which you might find, may find limited, but let me offer a, a, a point of view. Um, I'm struck by how little appetite the Trump administration has for those kinds of cultural issues. And what is much more characteristic of him is kind of casual and it's, it's the opposite of systematic. It's that, that this casual and brutal reduction of women in their places. And I think one of the things um, that is striking, for example, in this way is, is the role of Kellyanne Conway, who is the person who is sent out to do the most dangerous work and is the person who's going to be the most humiliated and discarded when all of this is over, that she's been the best soldier and she will pe get the least reward. Um, but I think, if, I mean, how interested in, is Donald Trump in abortion issues? How interested is he in, you know, the, the, the agenda of the religious right, as we used to call it? I think very, min he'll, you know, whatever is the minimal they want is what he will give them. He, that, that's, not, that's not his cause. The kind of casual brutality toward people. Racial issues, he's got rather more um, excitement about. But um, that, that, anyway, that's the way it looks to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Frum. Uh, it seems to me odd in someone who has suggested that this is a kleptocracy, that in discussing the points about the Russia connection, you haven't discussed the real possibility that it is, as in most things in Donald Trump's life, motivated primarily by greed yeah. and money. That the reason he cannot disclose his taxes is because it will lead down the trail. If you follow the money, it will wind up in Moscow, uh, or the source will wind up in Moscow. Um, and what is it? Uh, it, I mean, it, the, the American people seem to have simply swallowed whole the yeah. notion that everyone else who ever runs for office has to disclose their taxes, but not the one who's never run for office. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to ask you, too, yeah. do you think we will ever see his, uh, Donald Trump's taxes? You, 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 in something you wrote recently, you mentioned the possibility of a congressional subpoena. Um, I'm, I want to read this more than, like, the eighth Harry Potter novel or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, I think if we have um, democratic gains in 2018, we will see legislation at least moving through the House uh, that will require the Secretary of the Treasury to release tax returns. Um, I think that may become a very intense issue going into 2020. Um, but I, I share your suspicion. I think Donald Trump's health, if that law ever passed, his health would deteriorate very, very fast. <laughs> Are we getting the hook? Yes, I'm sorry to say we're running out of time, so we'll take two more questions. Great. Over here. Um, in the Please. aftermath of the election, a lot of my friends, we talked about how we honestly felt guilty about how we talked about Bush and Romney. Yeah. There was no need to assassinate their character <laughs> yeah. despite our like, immense policy differences. And I'm wondering if that conversation is happening on your side. Yeah. The false equivalence with Hillary and the, the email server and how she was evil and sinister and how that perhaps led to Trump and all these, uh, you know, for instance, my in-laws, they didn't vote for Trump, but they couldn't vote for Hillary. No. They have been fed how evil she was. Um, or in other words, why was the Never Trump movement so flimsy? Yeah. Um, that's a beautiful question. Thank you. Um, uh, my, wi my wife and I had a joke about how we needed to form a super PAC called Demented Hillary Haters for Hillary. Um, <laughs> uh, because... because because we're, um, yeah, but you need, per, you, you need perspective. And maybe when I talk about the things, that, the gifts of Donald Trump, that um, that may be, in the end, one of, when you actually hit the bottoms, thing, you suddenly start seeing up. And uh, yeah, this is a fight I had over Barack, um, 
Barack, about Barack Obama over the years. I mean, I don't think there will ever be a president I disagree with about more things than I did with Barack Obama. But how could you not see you know, sort of his dignity and you know his patriotism and um, and you you need to learn to appreciate that. And with Mitt Romney, I mean, you know. I don't know how many people watched the, um, the Republican convention in 2012, but th that night where you have people who tell you about the private good deeds of a man. I was in the hall for that. I just, they were overwhelming. Just like people, the people who knew him loved him. It's very striking with Donald Trump. His children didn't, I mean, they said all kinds of adjectives. <laughs> um, but one of the things you want to start is bring a, tell us a story about something good he did. Drawing a blank there. <laughs> um, Yes, that's right. And I, th I think, um, look, George W. Bush led the country into a controversial war, and the war was not a success. And um, that leads to a lot of ill feeling. But I think um, you can look back at him and say, you know, whatever you feel about the Iraq war, that this was somebody who, you know, came out of the presidency no richer than he went in, tried to do his best. Um, and maybe we can come away from this with, with, it would be good if we could have in real time the perspectives we get when we buy the David McCullough biographies of people. I, like, we are physically talking about how we were mean to Bush and Romney, yeah. and I don't know that that's happening on the other side about Hillary. And I yeah. encourage you as a thought leader. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I, I have done it. I mean, I, I, I've, I've written about this, and, uh, yes, I, and I, I, wrote about it, I, I wrote about it at the time. I, I, one of the things I got heated, you said something, I think on some, I forget now whether this was on a debate in person or in person, that I was asked the question, um, and I, I said, I thought Hillary Clinton was a patriot and Donald Trump was not. Hmm. Last question. So you've talked about the need to grab sort of common civic symbols and common <laughs> civic space to resist what may be coming and sort of seems implicitly a nonpartisan space, which is harder and harder to come by. You know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving didn't face anyone who had a strong self-identity as a drunk driver. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. The, and the president, for better or for worse, is or holds himself out as a Republican, and I, I just wonder if you have thoughts about how Democrats and Republicans could make effective common cause when there will be an election approaching ever more closely in which yeah. some people are going to want to turn the movement that's been into the streets into a movement to elect Democrats, which will be hard to hold yeah. Republicans in the same space. Well, one of the, that's a great question. I don't have a brilliant answer to it, but I think one of the places things like that may actually start is in this city. Um, because, you know, one of the, th the people, to, uh, people talk about being inside the beltway, you're out of touch, you're out of touch with some things, but you're very in touch with the realities of what it takes to govern this vast and complicated democracy. And what they, you discover is um, the defense appointees of Democrats and Republicans have more in common with each other than either of them have with any other type of human being. Same thing with intelligence appointees, treasury officials, people who've worked in those jobs. Um, and people have dealt with the complexity of those choices and how, um, you know, there are, there, are ide there are absolutely ideological elements to them, but they all, they're also important technical elements. And I don't, think, I don't think it's a coincidence that the place where Donald Trump has had the most difficulty is dealing with the intelligence community. And I think the military will be next. I don't know, the, the Donald Trump's um, press conference today overshadowed James Mattis had a press conference today in which he was asked, do you think the Russians interfered with the election? He said, obviously and absolutely, I, I think that. And in, in, the, in, in the elections of other democracies too. Um, so I, I think it is the, that I, I look, one of the places where this may start is with these governmental professionals, especially in the national security sphere. And one of the things that may be, a, another one when I talk about the gifts of Donald Trump is um, a reappreciation uh, in on the liberal side of the spectrum, where there's a lot of suspicion of defense and intelligence people, of how important their work is, um, and that we do not send democracy, we do not send freedom out into the world unarmed because it will be made a victim of, um, and we have seen that. Uh, and I, one of the, my criticisms of Barack Obama is the Russians were there. Where was he? Where was he in June and July? Um, and. Why didn't all the streetlights in Moscow go out at the same time for two hours every night? 
Um, why, did, why, wasn't, why didn't Vladimir Putin discover that his bank was offline? I mean, there, there, are, there are things, I, I don't know the tape, there are things that the United States could have demonstrated, done a show of cyber force that would have scared them. But didn't, but didn't Obama not do that because he didn't want to be seen with, uh, as tampering in an election? I, I, that's his excuse, um, but the, I don't think that's why, because the things he could have most effectively done would have been invisible to everybody except the Russians. Yeah. Um, you turn off the street, you know, noon in Moscow and the street lights don't work, and they don't work again the next day at noon. Uh, they get that. Um, and you don't have to ask Mitch McConnell's permission for that. But I think, and of those of you who are here who are governmental professionals, I mean, that, is, you know, that, you know, you've worked with people of the other party before, and that you can be the basis for that kind of sense of national obligation. Thank you. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you to David. Thank, thank you to Six and I. Thank you. Thank you.